All right. Hi, all, and welcome. Uh, I'm here with uh, Scott Forshaw, uh, co-founder and Hi. lead developer at Teridian. So thank you for joining me, Scott. You're welcome. And uh, today we'll be um, talking about uh, uh, quantum computing, Bitcoin, and all kinds of other things, um, looking at uh, what he's doing over there at Teridian. So I'm really excited to uh, get a chance to do this. Um, so to get off, get started, Scott, I guess it's just a good idea to start off with, uh, you know, can you give a brief explanation of what you're doing over there at Teridian? Okay, well, we um, started out primarily with a focus on, on information processing, um, which is I think what we were discussing before. Um, over the last six years, we've developed a proprietary sort of machine learning and data storage architecture that functions on top of a um, quantum simulation that's, that's specially designed to work with the algorithms that we've created. And uh, the impetus really was on not solving general purpose quantum computing. So there's like the, 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 the idea of general purpose quantum computing is that a, a general purpose quantum computer could simulate or emulate any function that a, a, a classical computer could do. Um, and conversely, really, a, a, a classical computer can do the same, but just with an exponential sort of time um, overhead attached to it. Um, we weren't really interested in that. We were just focusing on what were the most useful things that quantum could do in the near term or, or mid term. And could those be emulated, simulated, or, or you know, built as a specific application, specific hardware, software, or combined hybrid approach to them? Um, and that really is what we're about. And the focus really has ended up in the last two years, particularly on machine learning, because of the neural networks that were developed um, back in about 2015. That began to do some real uh, interesting things. It just took us a long time to understand what, how we were going to apply it, because that's the problem with quantum computing, is that it, it all sounds extremely exotic, but the application cases are difficult, and often you have to change your way of thinking about the problem in, in order to present it to a machine to solve. So, um, and that took a little bit of time for us to get our head around it. So, uh, but here we are now. Um, we've got um, some a API offerings in the authentication and identification tracking space. And we've now recently launched the Trillion Finance um, API, which is a, a very um, separate, but uh, it's built on top of Tridian's quantum machine learning. Um, but it's very much got a specific purpose and uh, we're, we're really excited about it at the moment. We've got some real good results and just recently uh, revealed. So um, hence, that's why we're here <laughs> with, with Blockonomics because we, we found that Blockonomics had a nice uh, pathway for us to, to integrate with. So uh, thanks for that. <laughs> a pleasure, glad you're getting a, a good use out of it. Um, and so I I get, before diving more into to Teridian, I, I, do want to then look at, you know, like general quantum computing and, um, you know, because I, um, as we mentioned, as I mentioned before, we started the interview, you know, I know very little about quantum computing and, um, you know, and obviously it's something that you hear often, but, um, you know, it, the average person, I don't think really gets what it, what it is and what it, you know, like what it's about. And you also mentioned that you're, that you that your service you're trying to the Teridian you're trying to do something different with quantum computing, mm -hmm. and so maybe could you just give a brief summary of quantum computing as much as you can? You know I don't know <laughs> how because um, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot to say yeah. about it. So, but then yeah, all right, well I'll try and resist to do that. There's, there's there's a kind of a humorous way of, of saying it is that in the classical world. Um, you've got uh, the bit, which is either a one or a zero. So it can only be one of two things. Um, 
And in the quantum world, that's replaced by this thing called the qubit, which can be one, a zero, or some combination of all those at the same time. Um, and that's really w where most journalists leave it and go, oh, it, it's this thing that can be everything all at the same time, and it's got all the answers to everything in the world, um, okay. and, it, and it'll, it'll break the universe. And uh, <laughs> nothing could be farther from the <laughs> truth. But it, but it is a li it is a little bit like that because of the way that the quantum system is, is built, um, or you know, or, or you know, exists. Um, everything's a probability. You can't uh, decide. You can predict where something is, or you can depict how fast it's going, but you can't know both at the same time. You can only sort of determine a distribution of probabilities that. Give you a give you an answer, and if you run that test a million times, the average answer is sort of like the wisdom of the crowd will give you an answer that is more than likely within some probability um, the answer that, that you want. Um, more importantly, I suppose is what what it what it can do. So I, I think probably if we look at it on the, the cryptocurrency side, um, that you probably heard about a thing called Shaw's algorithm, which was created by Peter Shaw some years ago, where he, the Bitcoin's held together by the SHA-256 hash algorithm, which is essentially two prime numbers, uh, P and Q, and you take two very large prime numbers, multiply them together, you create a semi-prime number, and that semi-prime number is then sent into another algorithm to sort of hash it up and do a few extra bits and bobs. But essentially, once you've got that semi-prime number, this massive number, the task is, how do you know which two prime numbers were the factor of that number. So if I give you the number, if I said, here's the number 15, give me its prime factors, you can easily go mm, five times three, five's prime, three's prime, 15, I found my answer. Where that starts to fall over with, and, it, and it's, it's analogous to a lot of real world problems that we face is that as the problem space starts to get larger, and I start to say, well, here's the number 519, or here's the number 6 million, blah, 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 blah. The, the problem space doesn't extend in a sort of square ratio where you, you, you can, it, it goes exponentially. So as you add one more bit to the problem, you don't just go up by a few hundred cycles. It starts to go up by billions and then trillions and thousands of trillions. So, by the time you get to um, the problem spaces with SHA-256 or you know 2056-bit encryption, the numbers that you'd have to factor would take you to the end of the universe to do with a brute force approach. It will work. Your Macintosh could do it if it was still around at the end of the universe, but it, it's not going to be very much use to you. And Peter Shaw worked out that you could use a, a, a theoretical quantum machine to, to and this is where the, I think the misnomer is, is people think that quantum computers factor prime numbers and they don't. They solve one tiny part of an equation that's 99% solved on a classical machine. So what, what, it, what it allows you to do is take a, a massive semi-prime number and do a thing what's called find its period which is um, a, a particular modulus once you've found so it's like a period finding it's finding the, the the point within this if you like a wave where the cycle repeats again once you've found the period you can use classical mathematics and number theory to arrive at the factorials the the, the two factors so the quantum machine doesn't solve uh, the Bitcoin problem. It solves one tiny problem of it. And, th th that, and I think people just think that you can give a hash code to a quantum computer and find the password out instantly for any hash code and Bob's your uncle. And it, it's not true because if you think about it, if you have um, a, 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 an SHA-256 hash, with a you know, 64 character output, if you give it 
a 256 character input, there's always going to be some hash that's the same for two inputs. So even if this thing could theoretically work out the passwords, it wouldn't know which password it was. It could still only give it, you'd have to it'd find one password and then it'd find the next version. So the trick is knowing where to stop within the space. So that's kind of like, if you like, um, taking some of the drama and the hype out of it. So it's, it's not some all singing, all knowing, thing that can solve every problem on the universe or that it's somehow got the answers to everything within it um and and that's you know it, um but it, i mean it's certainly and we're, we're quite a long way away from the the number of qubits required that is the number of if you think of transistors or bits on a classical computer processor the um the number of qubits required to reliably and quickly solve Shaw's algorithm for SH256 would currently take a football size, a football field size CPU to be held at minus 256, whatever crazy degrees, sub zero, near to space temperatures, and it not move. It's, it, it's almost beyond the realms of imagination until the scalability in that hardware terms comes about. So, um, do I think that Bitcoin is going to be affected anytime soon by quantum in that respect? Probably not. It's a, it's a very bold um, task. It's a bit of a vanity project and it's definitely what gets headlines when people say that, you know, quantum computers are going to break the blockchain. Um, there'll be lots of approaches that make it impractical, improbable and probably useless to use a quantum computer to do that. And assuming there was one on the planet, that someone's, you might as well make sure that you're, uh, if you reverse engineer somebody's transaction, that it's not just worth $3 because you've just used a $10 billion machine <laughs> to solve a problem yeah. that, that, that's going to net you $3 billion, $3, $3 in probably uh, five years in a penitentiary. So <laughs> I don't think we need to go running around at the moment. Uh, <laughs> So, well, I mean, there's lots of different approaches to it, and um, we, um, I'm not sure if there was anything else here. So, we had a. So, you asked me a question earlier. Was 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 about what the motivation was behind this, and it kind of ties mm -hmm. into it myself. So, um, machine learning is a very apt application for quantum computing because there are a number of known algorithms and search algorithms such as what we call uh, the quantum oracle Grover search algorithms and you can look these up if you look these up so the idea behind it, say a quantum oracle is it's like a black box just that we call them black boxes in quantum computing and, and generally in computer science and so we say well we've got this black box and it does these things so the black box is an is a machine that can give you a yes or no answer and tell you whether the answer in your hand is the answer to the secret question. Uh, it sounds a little counterintuitive, but it's, you know, you, 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 put, you put information in there and then you show it something and it'll go yes or no. It, it's like this. And they call it the quantum oracle. Machine learning as it stands at the moment is landing itself in hot water because Moore's law, which was this well-publicized thing a couple of years ago where we were reaching a point where transistor logic and gate size was getting so small that we're getting to the point that we can't make them. You know, these researchers making transistors that are an atom thick and they've got problems with it. It's not stable. Um, but like the prime factorization problem, there are lots of problems in computer science that don't respond to just throwing silicon at them. You, it doesn't matter how many CPUs you throw at the problem, you will not make a dent in the next magnitude of um, problem difficulty. Um, there's a well-known thing called the traveling salesman problem, which is, I say to you, you've got to go to 10 cities, and I want you to take the shortest route, and I don't want you to go through any city more than more than once unless you've absolutely got to calculate the route. 
And with three cities, it's not too bad. With five, it's all right. Once you get to 10, it starts to get stupid. When you get to 50 or 100 cities, we're talking more permutations than there are atoms in the universe kind of situation. And it doesn't matter how many um, processes you've got. You just don't make a, you don't really make an impact on finding the absolute lowest case. But quantum can give you a lot more um, help there through things like Grover's search because of this, it's got this ability to sort of uh, conceptually paralyze, uh, parallelize the, the search across many states and come back with a probable, uh, a probable answer. And uh, back in 2014 when we started Tridium, really, that's what I'd already decided that classical approaches to machine learning were, were dead in five years or less. Um, the GPU came along and, you know, there's a lot of serious, you know, I'm not, I'm not downplaying the, the advances in things like GPU technology and NVIDIA. It's amazing technology. It is not going to solve AI and machine learning. It's just not going to happen. It does fantastic things, but all we can do now with GPUs is put more GPUs on top of more GPUs. Use a bigger hammer to crack more nuts quicker and quicker and quicker. And it's an ever dwindling tunnel of light to the point where we go, we've reached the point that this can't feasibly scale. And it's probably not fair to the planet to do it because of the amount of sheer pollution and energy required. Um, I think the IBM released a paper with MIT about two months ago where they, they said that to get just 5% increase in efficiency of the image net set, which is a, a machine learning sort of data set, would require, I think it was 10 to the 5 increase in hardware just to just a budget over one percent so we're talking fifty thousand fifty thousand more times hardware just to move the needle a tiny bit now so this this speed that we've been seeing growing is now slowing down and slowing down and slowing down and and we've got to the point where we go we can't do it and the realization for me was back in 2014 that we were going to arrive at that so what we had to do was look at more exotic ways of looking at information and, and we needed to start storing it in a different way instead of storing it in this kind of verbatim, um, if you like, uh, perfect way. You know, we store a photograph and we don't accept any errors in it. Um, yeah, we've got JPEG compression and it, it fuzzes things down, but you know. So we kind of embarked on a, on a, a campaign to really reverse engineer information theory itself and look at information from the ground up and say, what is it that we're actually trying to store in the first place when we store a photograph? Is it the pixels or is it the feeling? Is it the colors? Is it how it makes me think? And is there a way to somehow, is that information somehow encoded in the way that we actually function as a species? Can we rip it out and find the way to put that into a storage mechanism that would mean the same to everybody who looks at it or every kind of machine. A little bit like the, the joke that they say, you know, when somebody's having a baby, push is the same in every language. <laughs> so, can you find the universal way of saying push? <laughs> that a computer can understand, a person can understand that you can dig up in a thousand years and somebody can pick it up and go, this means push. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not an easy fact. It's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> but along that journey, we did actually uncover some extremely interesting stuff, and we ended up developing the TQNN, which is a neural network, which kind of is very like that. It's it's got a very um, human-like ability to sort of regenerate its own memory from from new memories. You can lose information, and it can re-remember by looking at things that look similar to what it's forgotten and it can kind of rebuild itself in this neuroplastic fashion um and it but it just so happened that it's got a very uh it's very proficient at acting in a parallel fashion so it, it doesn't matter how much information you put into this system the speed of it doesn't change 
it always it always functions at exactly the same speed whether it's got a billion years of financial data in it or a minute of financial data you ask it the question and it can scan the entire landscape in the same amount of time so so we thought how could we put that to use and we ended up with with what we've got now so <laughs> obviously <laughs> <laughs> no wow that is that is really i am like I, i'm processing all this i'm not as fast as a quantum computer i guess but but no but like that's that's the 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 ai and and you know like that is i think that that is really cool with the the processing and you know yeah um i do want to get back onto that application of it into the the mo into you know like what you've done with with teridian and so on but first I do want to kind of go down the, um, you know, the, 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 the science fiction route almost of, you know, like you're talking about the AI and, you know, something that can think and forget and then remember and, and so on. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, you know, like I know that in our correspondence, we've, we've, you know, like you mentioned that, do you worry about, you know, like what you're doing with AI? Do you, you know, like, is this, no. No, <laughs> not really. Some people do. <laughs> I've had a few interesting emails over the years, um, but yeah, um, no. Uh, um, this sort of, I worry far more about people than I do about machines, and I've, I, I belong to a small subset of think people. I think that probably think that we're a lot closer related to machines than we think that we are people don't like to be told that they're algorithmic uh, <laughs> I had an argument a couple of years ago with Deepak Chopra who uh, a nice argument he's a really nice guy by the way I, I, I like him a lot but we had a bit of an argument over that because he said that he, a machine could never be like a human and I was like you're looking at it from the wrong angle you know and we had this sort of a uh, kind of drawn out um, discussion about it um, I think the fear of self-aware machines probably says more about the human nature than it does about the technology because if well if you if you do nothing wrong what have you got to be frightened of right that's <laughs> what people say in it yeah so so ask yourself the question why would this machine not like me because everyone says, oh, you know, these machines, they'll, yeah. they'll rise up and they'll see us as a bacteria and they'll laser beam everybody or, you know, put us in the matrix. <laughs> you can actually say, why would it do that? Why would a machine that's got no previous conceptions about anything, the only way that it would learn that kind of adversarial survivalist nature is by experience of how it's being treated. So perhaps, maybe in some Jean-Luc Picard future is a way to um, for us to reconcile ourselves with with that. I always figured memory is an interesting thing you know when we write things down and this is why I was so interested in information theory and, and about storing things in there and I was chatting before about losing what things mean. How long does it take for us to lose the meaning in something and it become a completely different story. So I, I, it's a really draconian way of looking at it. But you know, if we if we had an idea that the, the whole world needed a reset, um, or you know, we needed to get away from money, how much of something do you have to eradicate before it can't be passed on, that it won't grow from just the tiniest seed again? So you know, if you got rid of everybody over three years old in a liquidizer tomorrow and left just the babies on the earth with little overseeing computers that fed them and they all grew up and there was no books and there was no money and no way to reference to that what would the world how long would it take the un, the world to, to change is it possible is it fundamentally part of us to be the way that we are or is it have we evolved to a point where actually we might be able to responsibly change our own evolution for the better is is my question so, and i think that the typical idea of putting a machine in a box 
and giving it a prime directive like the Terminator, you know, or you, you will do this and you shall not do that, is really interesting, passed down, hierarchical from, from a creative, a, you know, a creator down to a, a subject and created in your own image almost. And so, so people have this idea that they're going to create a, a robot as long as it does this and it doesn't do that and it doesn't interrupt me while I'm watching Dallas then it's okay. But the minute it does something I don't want to do, I want to get a button and turn it off. Turn it off. And, and that's, yeah, so I think it stems, you know, it's probably why we put animals in cages <laughs> or whatever. It's, um, I think it's kind of in us to, to, to do that. And, I, and I'm not sure why, so. <laughs> but, <laughs> that gives a, a I am now having, you know, a, an existential crisis about uh, human yeah. nature and so on, and, and that it, it is a, it is a, a good a, a metaphysical yeah. dichotomy, I think you call it. Yeah, but <laughs> you know, I, I, I think of myself as often, you know, like I like consuming science fiction and so on. And you know, you mentioned uh, uh, Picard, and you know that 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 the new Picard series, you know, I think was touching. Well, was obviously touching on this. A lot. Yeah, I and, did. Watch you know, that. yeah, it yeah. brilliant. It, 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 well, I thought it was very good, but you know, I think that you brought in an extra part of that equation with, you know, like yeah, that that or you know, explained it well. You know, it is in our, you know, like it's a part of our nature. Where does that computer learn it from? Where does that, you know, a why are we scared of hmm. the the of you know an AI? You know, like what are we doing to make it? To, yeah. to, to want to, you know, who that might want to make us, make it fear us or whatever, or why, why we would want to fear it. Yeah. I think that that's, that's, given, that's given me a lot to think about. <laughs> you can see it as a machine, but I just see it as a collection of, you know, stable atoms of carbon, you know, yeah. you know which is not much different than yourself. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's you know, a good point. Yeah. It all depends how you look at it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, um, huh. um, yeah, and what investment you've got in that that machine yeah. or whatever. Life support machine, somebody probably said, no, don't turn it off, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's all subjective. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay, well, while I continue thinking about that, which okay. I'm, I'm going to be thinking about for a number of days, trust me. Uh, <laughs> it's given me a lot to think about. Um, I do want to, to, to head back into, though, the... Um, um the, the the applications of it because you know with with teridian you know you're you're taking these this these advances in in quantum and ai and applying it to you know i i hate to say the word practical but you know that that's just what business languages use these days uh, you know like uh yeah. we've all got to eat I, I, <laughs> yeah um, um but yeah like so so i guess describe more about that you know, like, like the applications of it and, and how you, you are seeing it now, you know, like on, on what you're applying with it um, at Teridian and, and, and then maybe what you want to see more in the future and what you want to, to yeah. yeah. On a general level, I mean, Teridian Finance, which is how we sort of got acquainted with Blockonomics is, is one aspect uh, of an application. We certainly didn't want to be, in, in a way, Teridian is not here to become vendors of, of solutions, we wanted to be really enable people to um, use a kind of technology that 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 could transform the way that they execute business processes, whatever whatever it might be. And in some ways, it's not for us to try and work out every single problem. But sure, when you when you're in early steps like we are, you've got to somehow communicate what it is that you do, and you have to maybe build an anchor application of demonstrations and stuff like that. And we've done a few. Uh, projects here and there we did some um, very um, sort of in in-depth um, facial recognition type stuff over in Hong Kong um, a year or two ago um, on the widest sense Teridian proper side on, on the on the non-finance side we've really just got the neural network TQNA which is this parallelized um, neural network that's got a, a neuroplastic capability um and it, it, it's it's kind of difficult to explain in some respects but I'll, I'll try my best so um we've got an application over there um 
called AuthID, which is our first API that we launched. Um, and that's available on, on cloud, on IBM cloud, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and it was the first real application that we said that, that, that had business value. So the whole idea behind that system is a completely machine learning driven authentication system. So the, the, the approach for us was if you're still using a database to store a hash code and a password, it's done. <laughs> it's just, yeah. yeah, stop doing it. Yeah. Because there's, there's a different way. Um, we created AuthID in order to allow the sort of instant and seamless sharing and validation of, let's just call them credentials or identities. So it, it's a, it's a semi-centralized or it can be decentralized. These machines can talk to each other and replicate, but let, let's just start with a centralized system. You've got one central hub and you want to share information from one organization to another without actually sharing any information. So I want you to, you, you, you're going on holiday from England, from America to, I don't know, let's pick a country. Uh, you're going to France. You're going to France, you have to get a visa. So you go to the French consulate, get a visa. And then before you travel, you know, you, you meet the criteria, you write the document out, you get the visa. A week later, you do something really bad. It gets put on a, a police station somewhere on the other side of Texas or something from where you live. They put it on a piece of paper and they put it in a drawer. And you go to France and then you carry on doing these bad things. So France had no way to know that you were a bad person, whatever it is. And the, this, this shines a light on the, the search problem as a whole and why at the moment enterprise systems don't work very well together. So healthcare systems and law enforcement systems, everything is siloed within that organization. So it's not enough to be able to, if you're an outside agency, not only do you need to know what you're looking for, you have to have an idea of where to look for it. Yeah. So some border authority in another country doesn't know that you've committed a crime in Texas, even right. though you live in Oregon, and doesn't know to even look there. Now, okay, the police force could do a national public register, but then it could get hacked and everybody's data gets pulled out. So you, this is why it doesn't happen. That's why we built what we built. What we created was a, a universal entity that can recognize anything that it's seen before, but not actually have it inside its head. So it's the equivalent of putting your head in a, you know, putting your brain in a jar with your eyeballs. You can't get in it, you can't pull the information out. Even if you get the information out and put it back together, because of the way it was built and constructed and the way the recognition works, there's nothing in this thing. But it has enough neural connections that when it sees your face, it definitely knows that it's seen you. Not only does it know that it's seen you, if you present the right context to it, like a passport, it can put all those dips for pieces of information together and say, yes, this, this I know. Yeah. So it allows multiple agencies or multiple businesses to share highly identifying credentials publicly as long as the person that's being checked presents the credentials that went onto the system in the first place. So the, 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 the chances of abuse are almost nil to nil to nil because you give somebody your passport anywhere to look at. They show yeah. it to a machine and the machine goes, uh, something not right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. <laughs> yeah. But you can do that in a way that doesn't reveal the identity of the individual. Yeah. 
So our approach to it was rather than trusting your personal identifying information into silo databases all around the world, one after the other, millions of the damn things getting hacked, broken. Trust AI because AI can be the trustable third party that's completely agnostic, that's completely uninterrogable. Uh, un uninterrogatable? I'm not, yeah, you, you can't yeah. break it, you can't get its memory out, but it can give you the information that you need. So it's almost like training a central brain with the identities of people, things, and in a smart city environment, you can hook all that together and suddenly start to process billions of pieces of information. So, and that's where the paralyzed nature, paralyzed nature um, is, is, is so important. So from things like say number re plate recognition, you've got a camera sees number plates on the highway. It's one camera, that one connection. It, unless it, unless there's one wholly massive mother of a database that's got your number plate and everything that it's done in the last 24 hours, how is that useful in the end? It's just data capture for the sake of it. Whereas yeah. with what we're building at Teridian, we're creating an almost semi-conscious, responsive neural network that can plug cameras into its head, it can put microphones in, it can put passport, it can put anything into it in parallel and respond when it goes, oh, I've seen something. That. Yeah. Yeah. And it can stop the process. So it's about creating machine learning that can be surprised and can stop the system when it sees something that's relevant or uh, poignant or whatever. So by layering those application layers up in the Tridian neural networks, we've started to build out more exotic um, systems. And by our neural networks can take about 128 parallel channels of information in one go. So it's reasonably a high degree of um, resolution. What's very important about it is that unlike traditional machine learning where you've got to train it with a thousand faces to get an X percentage of accuracy, because of the neuroplastic nature of the memory, you can give it 10 faces and from them 10 faces, it can recreate another million faces. So the amount of training that you've got to do is a lot less than it would be with a tra traditional sort of TensorFlow, you know, neural network or, or whatever it is. So that's another advantage of it. Also, it can lose information and rebuild it from experiential um, operations. Right. Um, I, yeah, it, and, and, it, and it can make determinations. It sort of defaults from being um, a probabilist. It can be a, a definitive machine on the one side. So when it sees something in it, 100% knows the answer. It's, it's, it's instantaneous. It just goes, that's the answer. Yeah. If the answer's not in its repertoire, if you like, it can probabilistically default to a very, very close approximation in, in the same cycle. So it, it's one way or the other without being told to it. And then if it sees something, then it solves it. It just puts it back in in the cycle. So it's self-training. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, but knowing when to stop that sometimes, can be, you need to sometimes stop it. But it's, um, yeah. So it, it's, quite, it's quite powerful. It's quite powerful stuff. So really, that's where we're at at the moment. That's where we've reached is with this neural network. And of course, of the 128 inputs that can go into this neural network, the one of those inputs can be a singular output from another 128-bit input neural network. So you can layer one neural network in. You can have 128 neural networks, all with 128 inputs, going in, down into the neural network to get a final sort of answer as to something's not right or something's right you know so it's uh, yeah it's quite it's a bit mind-bending <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, but uh, very interesting though. I, I, you know, and uh, yeah, I did this, the applications for it seem, seem really, you know, astounding, you know, and, and it, it does help, uh, you know, I know that a lot of people are concerned about those silos and those data silos that are yeah. so easily hacked. Well, you can't trust it. But I don't think you can trust yeah, an organization. So what we're saying is, mm -hmm. you know, is that machine learning is the new champion of data privacy because yeah. actually it's better to trust a completely agnostic bulletproof machine that yeah. even if you can open its brain and scoop everything out, you will never put it back together in a billion years. So yeah. it doesn't it doesn't matter. You know, you could leave, you could lose this on a subway train, the the whole hard drive, and it wouldn't wouldn't make a difference. Yeah, yeah. But it can replicate it instantaneously across a network. So that's a good, um, which is a good thing. Or maybe not. <laughs> it sounds a bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, I think. I don't yeah. want to put a chip in everybody, though. Don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. But I mean, I think yeah. machine learning and AI. AI, I don't really like the term because I don't think it's there yet. I just think it's a, okay. a, a bit of a, 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 a bit of artistic license there, sort of thing. But I think it gets a bad rep. I think it gets a yeah. bad rep for the wrong reasons. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, that makes sense, and and I certainly, you know, I. Every time I, you know, talk, you were talking about the passport. Every time I go to, you know, the the customs at, you know, whatever country I'm going to, you know, I, it is that, you know, like either they've got access to all of this data, or you know, they're they're not actually knowing who I am, and you know, it's, just picking, you know they're, they're just picking yeah. out person in three hundred and going, we'll deep check this one. Yeah, wait, right. wait there for half an hour. Whereas right. with, this, with a system like this, you can. You could scan a passport in about half a second and check every single database on the planet to see whether yeah. there's any flags on that identity at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then check yeah. it from there when it comes up red. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. But, uh, but I think that, you know, but the idea that perhaps, uh, you know, the international <laughs> agencies will share information in one central place. There's loads of benevolent reasons, you know, you're missing children. You're, yeah. Kind of yeah, you could use it for loads of interesting things. So, yeah, it's um, yeah, yeah. Well, and it, it it answers the next question that I was going to ask about you know the future and you know the what you see for the future both of quantum computing and that that AI in general and um, Teridian. Um, and you know, so I, I that's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's mm -hmm. a the a fun. Gives me a lot to think about as well. You're, you're giving me a lot to think about on this interview. I'm going to be doing a lot more research after. Sleep well tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I guess um, <coughs> just briefly, um, you know, you were talking about the GPUs and 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 in the um, earlier. And the written, you know, in, in the, the, the written correspondence that we've had talking about the, the mining, the Bitcoin mining mm -hmm. um, and the energy crisis that, that, uh, that is there. Um, I don't know, maybe give a, just a brief comment on, on you know, then that, that applica application to that, to the mining uh, issues, um, if you thought about it more. Uh, um, I don't thought about it too much. I, a lot of people ask me about mining you know or can you yeah. build something you know that's going to um, solve the mining <laughs> the mining problem um i think one of the biggest problems <laughs> with using a computer to solve the mining problem is perhaps the under the current regime is the proof of work because mm -hmm. machines like what we're building can't it's not evident how it arrived at the answer yeah <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. So how, how do you proof of work for something that you don't know how it works out? You just said this is it. This is the answer. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I don't care about your proof of work, you know. So maybe that's an outdated sort of thing. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of talk about the hash break. You know, I was just looking right, at right. The, the bullet points that we spoke about, which I think you know is relevant, but it's not going to be where the battlefield in crypto is. I don't think anytime soon and there are mm -hmm. there are numerous scientific and you know, research papers on 
on ways to make the resilience harder um, or, or, or even the actual model of the, the distribute, let's call it just a blockchain or a distributed ledger rather than Bitcoin or whatever right. it is, um, that there's no air miles in perhaps breaking the hash for whatever, that, you know, there's mm -hmm. fundamental design securities within the model itself that mean that it's pointless doing yeah. all this work to try and break things. Um, I did mention, I thought, I mean, it does, it does get on my nerves that the, the entire waste of energy is ridiculous. Yeah. It? Yeah. It's bonkers. And it's, for nothing, yeah. it's nothing other than vanity. And it just doesn't make any, any, any sense to me whatsoever. Um, but perhaps I think maybe things like quantum key, you know, crypt key distribution, which is this ability to teleport quantum information, which you probably heard about. Mm -hmm. so that's, you, know, you can take a quantum state like a photon and split yeah. it and send half the photon to, you know, this photon over there and that right. photon over there. And then you've got this um, link across time and space. And if you make this photon go that way, that one goes that way. And therefore yeah. you've got this. So yeah. And if this collapses, you know, it's been intercepted and you can abort the transaction. So maybe that there will be a more point to point way of, mm verifying that, that an asset has been been transferred but i've got to i've got to admit i am giving it too much thought although we have been we have been looking at um some kind of cold process technology for for prime number factorization we did mm -hmm. it have and are making some progress on that um but really at the moment our um, focus is more on um on, on quantum uh, analogs for, for particular mathematical sort of problems that our own algorithms present and we design we design them on purpose so that we when when you put information into our neural networks it's encoded in such a way that it actually takes work to put it in there so it's, it takes a little bit longer to put stuff into our system but once you've put it in what you can do with it is quite quite clever um but there's a computational power is actually encoded into the memory itself so it's what you'd call in memory processing um and i, I think that's really where the future of quantum will go in the, in the mid so and it's going to need to go in the future it is developing uh, true quantum memory architectures with things like in memory um computation which basically means that you know the memory is both the storage and the mechanism to retrieve it in 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 this reversible fashion without any use of energy um and that's that that's where i'm focused yeah for for, for the future um but uh, so I, it's possible that the quantum computing you know in the, maybe in the next 10 years would obsolete the need for hashing in the first mm -hmm. place maybe mm -hmm. possibly mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to deliver a why do i need a blockchain to prove something when something can only exist in one place in one time can be transferred and authenticated at source kind of thing so almost like blockchain a point of sale type of everything happens there in the quantum state and we're done and dusted and it couldn't happen unless it was true because that's the way the universe works. It's like, I can't have the universe, you know. Sorry, your universe has been declined, so, you know. <laughs> like, just see if the pin code works, you know. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, you know, maybe that, that would be yeah. more, more, to me, is more interesting. But, as I say, you've got to eat, yeah. it's baby steps all the way, isn't it? For, for right. Any, any company, I, I think right now we've just got to, deal with what we've, we've got in front of us. So maybe some optimizations in, in mining, you know, maybe taking, mm -hmm. being able to um, plant the, um, the ASIC rigs and target them into a range of hashes prior to starting so that the brute, brute force is reduced down to a minimum. If you, can, if you can pick a point on a map and say, well, we definitely know this hash doesn't belong down there or there or there. You know, probably here, then yeah. you could probably reduce 
the mining overhead by 50%, mm. like that. so it, it would be, watch this space. <laughs> a lot of hard work done on them. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying nothing else because I can hear <laughs> CEOs probably ringing me now going, shut up. <laughs> Mm. yeah <laughs> no that's 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 great no that that's interesting and yeah i'll i'll, I'll watch that space <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah all right well um i i you know i think that we touched on a lot of interesting topics and as sure. i said you know there's a lot that i that i'm going to be you know researching and thinking about when we get off this uh this call um but i guess uh so you know to 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 start ending things up ending things up is there you know like uh, anything that that you know you want to add that you know you've been itching to talk about and uh, would like to to share it the um well I, I, the, we brought that uh, the, in terms of trading and finance which we just i saw sort of shelved earlier on um for the last few years we've been working on doing quite a lot of predictive um analytical sort of review of, of market data which is which everybody does but um it's been in the last sort of eight nine months that we started training these tqnn models mm -hmm. on uh, multiple forex pairs um, and now we're bringing in uh, social signal and various other stuff so we can bring in to that neural network about 128 parallel signals so that could be 128 forex pairs, or it could be 64 forex pairs, 12 news channels, 10 social channels, and, and, and other triggers. And we can bring that all into one neural network. And we've trained uh, Tridium Finance on three years, or just 3.5 years approximately of, um, of market data. So we've, and then now we're actually put it out there to the test. So um, we seem, from my point of view, uh, um, as a scientist really or you know an analytics sort of type person that there was a lot of um, sketchy is the best word for it sort of signal you know would you going on there people you know we've got signals this we've got this we've got that we've got the other and it's like and I couldn't make any head and tail of any of it it just seemed like a black wall of silence and um, so we just said, yeah, well, let's just put it out there. So we did a couple of papers on it. Uh, sort of, we, we ripped Ethereum to pieces for about three months and did a three-year sort of back test a, a few months in front. And then we moved on to BTC, USD. So at the moment, we've got the model on Bitcoin, US dollars. Right. It can take multiple market positions across several Forex pairs. Um, and all the signals and analyze the market based on about three and a half years of data in about 0.1 of a second. So the, the, the whole idea of that really is about create, one, creating transparency. So, you know, we're introducing this kind of very open and get kicked in the face if things don't work as well as you think they do sometimes kind of idea but i think that's what it needs i just think that crypto is crying out for somebody to say <laughs> we haven't got all the answers this is not a, a sure thing um, yeah. but you know what if you're armed with the right analytics and the right information strategies right. then then it's better than nothing it's definitely better than nothing you know yeah and, and when we're seeing some real um exciting results from that now so um which is why we got involved with yourselves because the majority of people in that space are um uh, crypto savvy so we thought you know taking a, a crypto uh, bitcoin e-commerce model would, would work very well for us in the future especially with sort of granular sort of api access and stuff like that so um yeah that's where we're up to now so i'm going to be focusing on that for the next uh, but for the foreseeable future, we're, we're adding a, a few more trends in there and we're hoping the roadmap's going to develop over the next year, maybe adding a Forex pair or, you know, a new signal in every month so that people can sort of tailor it the way that they want it and um, get very quick back testing. But, you know, more importantly, sort of just execute 
massive predictive analytics that they just wouldn't be able to do on their own models um, yeah. e easily get their head around it and you know so by by pre-training some of these systems and then allowing people to merge them together in sort of a lego fashion and say well yeah i want to i want to do G, G, you know jpy usd euro gpp and i want right. to pull in vix and FTSE 100 but i'm not interested in that what's you know now go to the markets and tell me what you think is going to happen and um, mm. so we're, we're working on one hour windows at the moment so we're not doing um, mm. long term forecasting we're working on one hour spot price predictions and um, i'm not sure we, mm. have a little, we have a little meter on our website which gives us a thing i think what, uh, what it's up to at the moment Hopefully it doesn't say ten percent or something. Yeah, I was going to say I've got you know uh, I want to I want to make yeah, sure that it's going up right now. So you've got to be a bit brave. So well, we're current well we're currently running at eighty two point six percent with a four point okay. eight to one win. So eighty two point six percent over the last twenty four hours, which is you know is is good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it's it's, it's good. So um, we're we're real pleased with it. Um, We'll just continue to keep developing that model and um, hopefully uh, educate people you know in how to use it and bring a little bit of democracy really i think to the bot market so that's a, that's yeah. who we're, you know we're interested in working with bot developers okay um, who want to bring so you know hooking a bot up to the exchange is easy making it trade is easy giving it a brain is not so easy that's so important. yeah um so hopefully our uh, predictive analytics will give them a sort of very quick way to bolt out to another service provider and sort of go, this is where I think, what does this think based yeah. on, you know, but with a very definable and answerable predictive sort of probability that's not based on just, oh yeah, you know, we know what we're doing. It's, it's open to scrutiny. So you can, right. anyone, on there and see the last 23 hours of predictions rolling out live you know and if it's making a jackass of it it's making a jackass of it the markets change sometimes you know and then we have to, you know the, the, so the training process will go on and um, it'll only get better i'm sure so uh, yeah so then i i guess um with the because you know you're talking about the the one hour predictive um what do you see the timeline like you know i figure a one hour is you know on average i mean yes bitcoin can be volatile at times but you know generally it, it you know it isn't that much of a volatile in hours period that much of a volatile um yeah. thing so you know how does that then expand when you're looking at you know 24 hours or a week or a month or a, or a year you know we are training the models on longer time periods um there is certainly in terms of forex what the what the what the machine learning definitely did show us is that there was that that the that forex was one of the least influential factors hmm. in, in certainly in crypto terms. Let's just talk yeah. about Bitcoin, um, and so we focused on that, but we did actually it did actually wheedle out patterns that were very oh. very very subtly buried. Such that at the moment, let's say, I mean, I think the 24 hour accuracy is running at 82.6 percent on the hourly spot forecast. So that's 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 some serious going. I think it's you know it's 31 odds or something crackers. Yeah. Um, so there is that there. So now we're we're embarking over the next year really on a constant rolling program of training larger models, wider time frames, different um, ways for people to tune that model um at the api level and to, to sort of get what, what what they think that they want from it really um i don't i, I think that probably the next we'll go for is about three to six hours you, you know and then okay. we'll, we'll see where we're there with that um, i'm not wholly convinced that, that that's going to expand past six hours at the moment really okay. based certainly based on, on 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 just financial instruments i think we, you know we're starting to pull in social signal uh, and stuff like that because those have got a far bigger um, right. impact i think well the, well the data shows it just you know 
everything about this, everything about the Bitcoin and well, all forex markets would lead you to believe it's a random thing. You know, there's just if you took well, we've done it. If you took ten years of forex or three years of Bitcoin and add up and isolate all the times that it goes up and all the times that it goes down, and then order that into a chart, what you'll actually see is that for you know, if it was fifty thousand hours. For 25,000 hours, it went up. And for 25,000 hours, it went down. And if you added up the average across both of them, you will probably see that it's very far. It's not very far from the zero balance. So you're like, it's huh. one. wow. So how does something that looks random yeah. have a pattern? Yeah. But, you know, as we find out, when something happens in the news, everything's affected. So if right. it's affected, um, that's the definition of not random, because nothing would affect it. Right. So the stock market right. isn't random. The forex market isn't random. It's pseudo random. It looks random. It's just that the patterns are so deep, so convoluted, that it takes you to look at every single instance of every single you know um, happening um, to weedle out the strong classifiers in in the machine learning. And that's what our system is good at. So, uh, yep, yeah, it's all cool. <laughs> we're, yeah. uh, we're forward to a, we're looking forward to a you know a good end of the year on it and uh, slow, slow steady steps. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Was there anything else? I don't know where we're up to. I can't think. No, I I, I think that that yeah. uh, I I've touched a lot on what I I wanted to touch on and. Um, sure. I encourage all of the all of our viewers to to check you out at uh, Teridian and also check out the um, uh, written article, um, and I will put those down in the description for our viewers. Um, and you know, yeah, I really I really want to thank you uh, for for the really fascinating discussion uh, that, that that we've been having. I mean, I I've said it two or three times now, but you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna dig into some of this stuff and really start researching and and you know I, I, yeah. my it's mind as you said my mind is bending <laughs> yeah yeah well we had this there was a really interesting thing i mean just as a thing so, so when you look at anything like this information so you get a piece of paper like that yeah yeah, yeah. if i write the letter a or I like the letter a or you know the, the letter a yeah how many ways are there to write the letter A in the same piece of space? Yeah. In a different way, but it all means exactly the same exactly thing. the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Freaks yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> that bombshell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, well, they give me some time to go. No worries. To continue getting my mind blown. Uh, no. uh, <laughs> I'm going to say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to our viewers. Uh, and again, check out Teridian. Um, we at Blockonomics really thank you uh, for, for taking your time out of your day to, to talk with us, uh, to talk with me. Um, you know, and I think that, uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. Everybody watching when this is on YouTube, check it out. Check out the uh, written article. Check out uh, Teridian's website. And uh, thank you. Thank you, cool. Sam. Thank you. Cheers. Great. Have a great day.